It happened in broad daylight in front of hundreds of eyewitnesses. It was filmed and photographed as the bloodshed unfolded. So how come there's so much bitterness and disagreement over the events of Bloody Sunday? How did such a public incident become mired in confusion, myth and half-truth? Do we really know the story of Bloody Sunday? The Puritan Regiment itself describes its hallmarks as speed, aggression, lethality. That's what they're about. Therein was the, the seeds of a disaster. And not surprisingly, what we got out the back was a disaster. I don't think we've seen any inquiry on this scale. The Londoners are blackened, and to this day, they still are blackened. Set the truth free. How many words does it take to say sorry? After 12 years and hundreds of millions of pounds, the Savile Report into Bloody Sunday is finally about to be released. It will be scrutinized intensely and its findings are sure to be controversial. In this special program, Insight looks at the questions Savile must answer. Why were battle-hardened paratroopers used against unarmed protesters? Was there a conspiracy at the heart of government to use lethal force to get tough with the rioters? Was a rogue para unit out of control in the bog side? And why did the IRA fire at the soldiers before they stormed in? We have questions too about the Savile Tribunal itself. How on earth did it become the longest lasting, most expensive legal process in UK history? Insight explores what Savile may say about the truth behind Bloody Sunday. The Bogside in Derry. Locals dubbed it Free Derry. It's where the troubles first exploded. Free Derry. In the early 70s, a square mile of no-go area for police and soldiers. But the IRA were here in strength. I think that the existence of Free Derry was not just a challenge, but was an insult uh, a, to all established ideas of law and order. They were members of the IRA, armed and operating uh, openly, and sometimes walking up the streets with guns. It was common talk within our communities that the, the IRA had hijacked the civil rights movement, and this was before Bloody Sunday. So there was this whole thing in our head that, you know, Bloody Sunday was was a, an eventuality that the IRA wanted. Thirteen unarmed protesters were shot dead by the parachute regiment. But two prime ministers have since cleared them of that allegation. Even the paras now admit the people they killed were innocent. One of those killed had been a Royal Navy cadet. Jim Ray was 22. Jim was not a violent character. Jim had a great capacity for love in his life. Uh, would have went that extra mile to help. I remember him as a pesky wee kid who would annoy me in the sitting room when I was courting. <laughs> it was devastating when Daddy died because to me, I felt like I was a daddy scared. The road to Bloody Sunday begins in the late 1960s. A worldwide clamor for civil rights brings protest and civil unrest, sometimes violently suppressed. In Northern Ireland, nationalist discontent erupted into violence. By January 1972, the Troubles had already claimed more than 200 lives. Here in Derry, 10,000 anti-internment protesters were passing close to the spot where just Three days earlier, two RUC men had been killed by the IRA. The march was banned and blocked from going along this road to the Guildhall. Instead, it was diverted up Rossville Street towards Free Derry. Rioting breaks out. Soldiers from the Parachute Regiment launch an arrest operation. They shoot 13 men dead. 14 others are wounded. 
The Paras said they'd been shot at, but the Catholics in Derry said the dead were innocent. The battle for the truth had begun. We accuse the Colonel of the Parachute Regiment of willful murder. The government ordered Lord Chief Justice Widgery to investigate, and his conclusions were devastating. He exonerated the soldiers and blamed the dead. That obviously did make it worse. Kevin Toulis is an historian and an award-winning filmmaker. The fact that the British state had carried out these killings and then institutionally and authoritatively lied about that. So that, that was a double crime. With Lord Widgery's findings discredited, the families of the dead campaigned for a new inquiry, something unprecedented in UK law. In 1998, Tony Blair said yes, and he established the Bloody Sunday Inquiry under two Commonwealth judges and its chairman, the rising star of the House of Lords, Lord Savile. What we really want to know is who was responsible for this killing, this entirely unjustified killing on the streets of the United Kingdom. This inquiry will fail unless it answers the big questions about how this happened, why it happened, not who shot whom. These pictures were filmed by Willie McKinney. Within an hour of shooting this film, he would be shot dead by the Paris. When the march reaches the bog side, the first parachute battalion is in reserve at this Presbyterian church. By now, the marchers are just about a hundred yards away. They can be seen by the Paris from the rear of the church. Para observers are stationed on this low roof. When the rioting begins in the bog side, the situation quickly deteriorates. And what happens next goes right to the heart of Bloody Sunday. An official IRA gunman is in position in this building. He fires a rifle across waste ground to the Paris position at the Presbyterian Church. The Paris, they shoot and wound two civilians nearby in William Street. Who shoots first is in dispute. This is up to 20 minutes before the Paris enter the bog side. The Paris have been warned to expect snipers. Will Savile conclude the official IRA rifle shot up the ante? Did it mean these battle-hardened shock troops hit the ground firing? The Paratroop Regiment itself describes its hallmarks as speed, aggression, lethality. That's what they're about. They see themselves as a frontline combat unit, driving through the enemy's uh, defences. Colonel Tim Collins commanded the Royal Irish in the Gulf War. Before that, he was Director of Operations for the SAS, and commanded specialist units of the Parachute Regiment. I know many of the people who were there on that day, particularly from the machine gun platoon of one para. Um, the bottom line was that this was a battalion which had recently been in Aden, and at that time they had taken part in what was probably akin to the fighting that's going on in Afghanistan now, and their expectation was of more of that violence. The expectation of people on that day was that they were going to a gunfight and they were handpicked because they were the best at it. And so their expectation was one of huge violence. And in a funny way, that, that prophecy became self-fulfilling. The bog side has changed considerably since 1972. The three huge tower blocks of Rossville Flats are gone. But it was here that the Paras would strike first. The killing zone was small, just about 50 metres in each direction from where I'm standing. The Paras had been sent in to get tough with the rioters. The seeds of a disaster had been sown. I've listened to hundreds of Savile Inquiry witnesses and from their testimony we can piece together key events. After about 20 minutes of rioting, the Paras storm into the bog side, their armoured cars knocking people down as they go. Almost immediately, the Paras begin shooting, killing teenager Jackie Duddy behind the Rossville Flats. 
An RUC investigation will later conclude he's been murdered. Then the Paris begins shooting at a group of people gathered at a rubble barricade stretching across Roscoe Street. Eyewitnesses paint a real scene of shock and confusion. These are live bullets, but some people don't even run for cover. Six people are shot and killed on or near this rubble barricade. A para radio operator can't see what the soldiers are shooting at. He tells Lord Savile he can't see any gunmen. Once it kicks off, sometimes it's impossible to control it. And people who were there on the day who were paras were saying that as soon as they heard the firing coming from a couple of streets away, they assumed their comrades were ta being taken on across the square and a couple of streets down. Their expectation th was that we'll be next and we're going to get our shot in first. So actually, this is what I mean by a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once this starts, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. By now, seven people are dead, and the para radio operator is getting more concerned. He gave evidence that he had received a ceasefire order at one point, that he had not just shouted to the paras, ceasefire, ceasefire, that he ran along a line sort of with them and tapped them on the shoulder and said, ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire. After that, he went into Glen Fanna Park. The shooting England Fata Park is mainly down to one small group of soldiers, a four-man squad known as a brick. They've already killed at least one man on the barricade, and they're about to kill another six, accounting for more than half of the people killed on Bloody Sunday. A ceasefire has been ordered, so Savile must ask why this brick goes on to kill so many people. Are they out of control? Certainly, once they enter Glen Fata Park, they're out of sight of senior officers who've remained on Roswell Street. The Paras have come in here chasing a crowd of civilians who are trying to escape. The brick opens fire quite quickly, shooting a number of men. One of those who's hit is Royal Navy Cadet Jim Ray. He lies half on the pavement, half on the road just over there. Eyewitnesses say a para walks over to where he's lying, puts a gun to his back and finishes him off. Terrified, the crowd tries to flee through a narrow alleyway at the far end of the square. The paras shoot teenager Jerry Donaghy. Then eyewitnesses say they shoot father of eight, Jerry McKinney, who has his hands in the air. Then the paras shoot Willie McKinney, who moments earlier had been filming the Bloody Sunday March. Finally, a member of the brick, identified as Soldier F, takes aim across the street to where Paddy Doherty is crawling to safety. Soldier F shoots him dead. Barney McGuigan steps out to help him, waving a white handkerchief in the air. Soldier F takes aim and shoots him through the head. The last man shot on Bloody Sunday is dead. Clearly, this was a, a regiment that had a far more brutal reputation, and the, that reputation was probably justified in that they were far uh, more violent uh, at suppressing demonstrations. They had a fearsome reputation. This regiment didn't come to Derry on their own. There was somebody sitting with suits on them in the realms of power and have made this happen. I, I certainly believe it goes all the way to the top. In 1972, Northern Ireland was on the brink. Savile's been told some military commanders felt it was time to get tough. But was there a conspiracy leading to the very heart and to the very top of government? Was there a conspiracy to teach these people a lesson? That's what we want to know about this. Was it conspiracy? Was it cock up? And at what level did the blame lie? Or did it run absolutely from the soldiers on the ground right up to the High Command. I think Lord Savile will have some difficulty trying to trace how far up the chain of military and political a uh, command responsibility for Bloody Sunday went because there's simply an absence uh, of evidence. No, um, I, I would always advocate the cock-up theory uh, above anything else. And I think what we had here was a, a series of, um, of regrettable and incompetent events that resulted in the deaths of um, uh, 14 people, and these were innocent protesters that had been shot dead. So, what prompted the Paras to go in shooting in the midst of innocent, unarmed civilians? 
The provisional IRA say they fired no shots that day and they were unarmed. So Savile may look at the actions of their rivals, the official IRA. We know that one official fired a rifle at the Paris before the soldiers entered the bog side, but a second official fired pistol shots at the Paris as they charged into Rossville Street. Two officials, both opening fire. But can that really explain why the Paris go shooting into a crowd of unarmed civilians? They've been ordered not to conduct a running battle down Rossville Street, but they still end up firing 108 rounds. They tell Savile they aimed only at gunmen and bombers. But if that's to be believed, these crack troops missed their target every time. As for a high-level conspiracy, Savile's uncovered no hard evidence. There's no smoking gun in Downing Street. So was Bloody Sunday cock up in the midst of mayhem or a massive breakdown in army discipline with soldiers running amok? And what will Savile say about Jerry Dunahy? He was in the IRA's youth wing and was one of those killed in Glenfada Park. Civilian and military doctors examined him and found no weapons. Later, the RUC photographed his dead body with nail bombs in his pockets. Will Savile conclude the bombs were planted there to justify the shootings? An attempt by the authorities to protect the soldiers. Clearly, the battleground wasn't restricted to the bog side. This was a battle for the truth a battle for hearts and minds. That was really believed, and people really believed it was a gun battle, that it was those who were shot were either snipers or bombers uh, or gunmen, um, and people firmly believed that. They wanted were effectively branded as being terrorists. Within 24 hours of it happening, within 12 hours of it happening, like it was, within 24 hours of it around the world, and they did that to justify the killing of the people. But what they didn't do was actually bring criminal charges against any of us at all. Lord Savile is conducting an inquiry, not a trial. His job is fact-finding, not pronouncing guilt or innocence. But the tone of his report will be crucial. It will be a major setback and embarrassment to the military if Savile concludes the Bloody Sunday dead were killed unjustifiably. The Paras on the ground had exceeded the orders that they were given, the specific orders immediately before their action. I think that Lord Savile is going to have to draw conclusions from that about the attitude and the assumptions uh, and the discipline of the Parachute Regiment. I use the word murder all the time because this was all premeditated as far as I'm concerned. These, these paratroopers came in on a murderous mission they're saying my, my brother or my mother's son was a murderer, was a petrol bomber, was a stone thrower. And you see, regardless if he was a stone thrower, there's still no justification for murder. Savile has heard serious allegations and he faces profound issues and perplexing questions. But it's 10 years since he began hearing evidence in this room. Why has he taken so long and cost so much? Savile widened his investigation, going into minute detail. Multi-million pound high-tech legal arenas were created here in Derry and in Westminster, complete with a virtual reality bog side. The tribunals cost 200 million pounds, half of that going to lawyers. And the final bill could be higher. One cabinet minister let slip, it could end up costing us 400 million pounds. This inquiry had become a poison chalice for Savile. There's no reason why it should have been a poison chalice. Doing a public inquiry is in itself a good thing to have on the CV, but doing it and taking this long over it, inexplicably, so far, doesn't do you any good at all. 
some of the length and the detail that he went into was an attempt to, if you like, lay to rest the ghost of witchery and, and signal himself not to be someone that was going in quick and fast without attention to detail and certainly not um, trying to be part of a cover-up. I, I was in favour initially of the actual the, the inquiry, but in any rational view of history, you, you have to look and see, has, has the, the use of treasure and resources been worth it? And I, I must say, I, I don't believe that it is worth it. It has never been about money. It has been about seeking the truth of what happened that day and by bringing those people to account for what happened. What happened was a dark descent into death and disaster. Will Savile see the legacy of Bloody Sunday as a recruiting sergeant for the IRA? I think the idea of shooting back at, uh, at the British after Bloody Sunday, sort of, it matched the mood, very closely matched the mood of young people in the bog side. When I went to prison, actually, I was, I was um, amazed upon talking to many of the particular prisoners from Derry, but not just from Derry, and whose primary motivation to become involved in the IRA was their experience of Bloody Sunday. Savile may be the biggest event in UK legal history, but this enormous focus on one tragic day causes bitterness. Only 200 yards from where we're sitting, uh, we've had between 100 and 116 people killed. You've had the Bloody Friday bombing, you've had the Le Mans bombing, you've had Tiban uh, massacre, you've had the Shankill bomb, and there's not one call uh, for an inquiry. We don't have, as in South Africa, a wider truce and reconciliation process where we're examining all different categories of crimes. So we're not having a, uh, an inquiry into the events of Bloody Friday, even although the Republican leadership who carried out that attack, who ordered those killings or those bombings, are in power now and we know who they are. It was a, 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 a shameful day. It was something that the rest of the army looked as a perfect example of how not to do it. I accept now that the people who were killed on Bloody Sunday uh, were, were innocent. You know, I'm sure that where my father is now, he has forgiven. So I will forgive in his name. But I still want my father's name cleared. The man who was second in command of the Provos in Derry on Bloody Sunday is now second in line at Stormont. Savile has been a 12-year-long, £200 million investigation into former enemies who are now partners in government. His inquiry was supposed to lay controversy to rest. Instead, Savile became a source of controversy. And it may not end here. Already some of the Bloody Sunday families are looking for prosecutions. Sadly, their pain remains, as does the hurt felt by all the victims of the Troubles. And after all this time and all that money, Savile may end up telling us what we already know.